Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the Brinda Sumaya lecture as part of the Cornell Architecture Department lecture series, and also quite notably, the A.D. White professor at large, who is joining a greater conversation about architecture and culture and society at the university. So we're extremely, extremely honored and lucky to have you, Brenda. Uh, please help me welcome on behalf of the Department of Architecture and Cornell University and the uh, A.D. White Professorship of uh, uh, Professorship at Large, and my dear friend, Mary Woods, please help me welcome Brindo Sumai. Thank you. Thank you, Lubin. Good evening to all of you. It's truly a pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening. I would like to begin by thanking a few people amongst, I'm sure, many others who made this possible. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Robert Wise, the chair of the A.D. White Committee, Professor Mijin Yoon, Professor Porus Olpadwala, who is not here, but a very dear friend of mine, and Professor Mary Wood, who has held my hand uh, through many years, uh, true privilege of knowing her, and I would like to particularly thank her. I would like to thank Robert Boulder and Martha for the exhibition that you very kindly organized and uh, preserved the panel so carefully from many years ago. And Martha Walter for the library exhibition that was very nicely done. Cindy, she's the one who coordinated with all my people in Mumbai. Thank you so much. It means a lot when you come to a faraway country uh, for everyone to, to be welcoming and to make arrangements so well and made every part of this trip seamless. And of course, Lubin, Professor Lubin Dimchoff for his very kind introduction and support today. So, um, architecture like civilization is dynamic and ever evolving. While exciting architecture is being built all over the world and thus expanding the vocabulary of contemporary architecture, we architects working in India have to find our balance in design, enabling us to be part of the new and creative experiments ahead, as well as be part of what has gone before. Creativity flourishes when new ways of looking at the same problem are brought together, when people with different backgrounds, training, and experiences bring together their perspectives. Therefore, the motivation for inclusion and diversity should come not only from the desire to create a just society, but also because it leads to better and more powerful creative processes and solutions. Robert Campbell said, there are of course prominent pundits today who believe we live in a single global culture. I'm of the opposite persuasion. That's what he said. I tend to agree. I think one of the most important things that architecture can do precisely is to create the differences before the whole planet mixes and matches into the same gray soup everywhere. The only way to do that is to be very sensitive and responsive to whatever is genuinely different in the site, the culture, the climate, and the protagonist of the space, man or woman. So um, this is a picture from an exhibition that my studio designed called India and the World. And I'm showing it today because uh, I've also named a shared desire for dignity. That's the name of my presentation today. So what makes a society civilized and hence dignified? There is no single answer that defines and explains a civilized society. It is my belief that what one person might believe is wild and uncivilized may actually have great depth and meaning to another society. Coming from the East, but having lived and studied in the West, my interpretation will naturally reflect my personal thoughts and experiences. In my architectural practice, which is diverse in every way, be it contextual, geographical, or cultural, I have always believed that we have to have a deep engagement with society. Our studio was the designer of a landmark exhibition, India and the World, 
a history in nine stories. The objects we worked with exhibited huge differences in our cultures, how interconnected our world is in every way, and the beauty and rich historical narratives derived from each object. There were over 200 objects for this exhibition. The discobulus or discus thrower from 100 to 200 AD, the Roman copy over here in marble after the original Greek statue, is one of the most famous sculptures from the ancient world and the British Museum. It shows an idealized athlete, naked, refined, and eternally youthful, seemingly captured in the moment before releasing the discus. Hanuman, one of the central characters of the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, and the discobulus represent the citizens of their worlds, East and West. Although their forms differed, they collectively transcended time and space, defining a global citizen. Kenneth Clark says, the moment thus captured in the statue, discobulus, is an example of rhythm, harmony, and balance. The discobulus portrayed that a civilized society needs harmony with nature, balance, beliefs and thinking, rhythm through music and dance, and Hanuman with strength, a conviction of justice and truth, heroic initiative with innovative thinking, and assertive excellence, standing up for one's own and others' rights and beliefs but in a calm and positive way. And so in architecture, as we need to have rhythm, harmony and balance in our design, we also need to have strength, heroic initiative and assertive excellence. The architect's role is that of a guardian. He or she is the conscience of the built and the unbuilt environment. We are connected with every aspect of life and living. These are some of the qualities which have been handed down to us over centuries in different ways and from different parts of the world that I believe makes a society civilized and hence dignified. So of course, Mahatma Gandhi, he believed that in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And I think that's really important for us all to understand. We don't have to be us, you know, all the time putting our points across, but how do we make the difference? So naturally I'm an Indian and whatever I am comes from my heritage. It reflects, of course, in my work in many ways. So I'll show a few slides of 1947 when India actually became free. And this is the image of uh, that particular, the stroke of the midnight hour. I'm giving a little background to show you what I was born soon after independence and the migration, the partition of Pakistan and India was the biggest migration that ever took place in human history. The, the photograph in the center is the library in Calcutta, which was the capital of Bengal at that time, who had to divide the books between Pakistan and India and how do you do that? And of course, the pictures to the right and left showed uh, the migration both west and east between the two countries. So when Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru came in as our first prime minister, he did a three-pronged attack. He believed that India had to have law, we had to have economic stability, and we had to build institutions. So the picture in the middle is how the women were working in 1947. This is a coal mine uh, in central India. I don't know how different things are today, so uh, that's another story. And to the right is the birth of the first Indian Institute of Technology. Today we have many of them. They send Indian engineers around the world and especially to your Silicon Valley as well. But Nehru also encouraged other parts of, he encouraged photographers. The upper left is Humai Vairavala, who is one of the first women photographers of of India, her photographs of Nehru, Lady Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten are still extremely famous even today. And we had the artist movement to the right, where we had people like Raza and Hussein, Ara. They changed the idea of colonial expression of art. I dare not talk too much because I know we have some well-known artists here today. 
but they brought in an Indian monism in art. Today, their art sells for millions of dollars. The picture to the bottom left is uh, Dr. Homi Baba, who brought in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and Science and, of course, atomic energy also to India. And to the right, Charles and Ray Eames, who were brought into India but through the Ford Foundation and Nehru to set up the first design institute called the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. So many things were being done at that time. Of course, all, many of you know about Corbusi and Khan, but there was much more. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that actually Nehru went to Jane Drew. She was very busy with Maxwell Fry in Africa. And it was she who suggested that Corbusier come in and work in India. But they were women, Indian women working too at that time. And this woman is Yuli Chowdhury, who worked a lot uh, in Chandigarh behind this Pierre Janare. But these were the hidden figures whom many people don't know about or don't talk about. They talk about the masters, uh, the men masters, of course. Korea, Kanvinde Rajay Doshi, who just won the Pritzka, Rehman and Ravel. But we had many women working at that time too. Perrin Mistry was the first uh, Indian woman architect. Praveena Mehta worked very closely with Charles Korea. Um, didn't get much credit though, I have to say, and so on and so forth. So um, Lubin mentioned about the bridge generation. I was six years old when I went to Nalanda, which was the ancient monastery built of red brick in central India. And I decided I wanted to become an archaeologist. I became an architect, second best maybe. And the other day I was looking um, at a film in the National Geographic about this woman archaeologist called Pepe, who's trying to find Alexandra's grave in, um, in Alexandria, in Egypt. And she looked like she was having a lot of fun. So I don't know if I missed out on something. And um, the, these are pictures of my parents. Uh, Lubin has already mentioned them. I grew up in the city of Mumbai. And we were young architects. I studied at the JJ. We visited, of course, the standard Taj Mahal and, and Corbusier's buildings. And then the picture to the left is the work I did actually at Cornell. Under Alan Chimokov, it was a stadium, and I got a master's from Smith College. And then I went back to India. So in 1973-74, I went back to an India with poor communication and little or no patronage from the government. But I built. We struggled. This was the shed I began my work on, uh, a young woman in a sari, uh, quite isolated. We had a national emergency as well. But we built. And from 1978 to 2022, I think that's what we did. So talking about the projects, there must be very few countries in the world where architects have such varied challenges as we have in South Asia today. Our involvement ranges from upgradation of slums to large corporate and public buildings, wonderful, exciting and fulfilling tasks that span our careers and take us from being high-tech professionals to barefoot architects. Our Indian traditions are a source of inspiration to us architects as we attempt to infuse meaning into our work. The contemporary architecture of India today is the built expression of an interaction between a global culture and our rich past. Hindu, Buddhist, and Islamic traditions were followed by the colonial influence. And finally, post-independence, the legacies of Corbusier, Khan, and other Indian masters. In fact, some might shrink from the idea of an Indian architecture at all. So what I have done today is I have chosen four projects. Um, I've chosen one uh, where we have a very uh, sort of a inclusive and diverse practice. One project from what I call culture, one project from our conservation, a contemporary project, and one community project. And each one of them I've ended with a short, a uh, very short audio uh, video as well. So coming, yeah, I, I began with this. Uh, we love to do uh, different types of galleries, money and coin, jewelry, textiles. We have a very rich tradition in India. But I'm showing this because this is a living bridge. And this is regenerative architecture. This is what we've got to do today. These bridges are made in northeastern India. 
and they are made from the roots, living roots of the ficus tree. They live for 500 years. They don't need, uh, they, they, they're not ever destroyed and they function beautifully and organically. And I think that's what we've got to think. How do we work? As I mentioned earlier about the rhythm and working with nature. So we have to understand, to understand India, we must understand this relationship with the outside world as well. So this was the exhibition, India and the World. We worked, uh, it was the first exhibition where the British Museum brought over 200 of their objects to India. We were the designers and we worked with the Delhi Museum um, and 20 other Indian private and public museums. So it was a wonderful experience for our studio working between London, Mumbai and Delhi, deciding what were the objects that we had to choose because it was to celebrate 70 years of India's independence. And the exhibition showcased over 200 objects and works of art, not only from the collection of the British Museum, but as I mentioned, around 20 other museums and private collections. It highlighted the strong connections Indian shared historically with the rest of the world, promoting an exchange of ideas and influences that have helped create a global culture. The exhibition was divided into nine sections with different narratives. So I'll run through this. We, we saw how carefully the objects were being looked after and we worked with the British uh, curators and of course the Indian curators as well. And then we had many workshops. I'm showing this to you because I truly believe that architecture is not about individuals and not about stars. It is so much a collaborative uh, profession. I can't think of any other profession which needs so many different people and so many diverse thoughts and ideas from various other verticals to truly come up with something that's worthwhile. So we had a lot of exciting uh, discussions. We learned so much um, over a year. And then we came to the actual physical uh, uh, exhibition. It was in a very, very important museum, the biggest museum in Mumbai. It was the Prince of Wales, but now it's the CSMVS. And we had to decide about the object. So we talked about storytelling, conversations. What is the universal and 21st century museum? What is the story that a museum today has to tell? Um, does it have to be uh, experiential, uh, what is it, the communication, and to whom does it have to communicate, depending upon where it is located? So the Western world believes time moves on a linear path. India believes time moves in a circle, at least ancient India. So there are high points and low points, but time is alive. It doesn't just move on and on. It is continuously on a circle. So based on that, we worked the concept out for this exhibition. And since India and Mumbai is so crowded, we had to bring the people in through a dark space to ensure a spatial experience, a vortex, and then brought them in to the actual um, exhibition itself. So beginning with the rotunda, all this came from, from England, brought into India. So you can imagine how exciting it was. Here's the discobulus coming in. And here it is after we actually put it in the museum itself, the entrance, as we move through. So there were nine parts, the shared beginnings right from the Acts to the first cities of Mohenjo-daro, of Egypt, and of Mesopotamia. How did we do it? We used the Harappan um, plans and worked them onto the walls, onto the flooring. And then we came to the great empires of Chandragupta Maurya and the beginning of the Buddhist. Uh, religion, how it was spread, the grand uh, regal aspects of India through the 10th to the 12th centuries. And uh, so we had a lot of very, very important objects which talked to each other. I don't have enough time to go into in detail. And then we came to picturing the divine. And why this was important to show that you see two pictures here. You see a wooden Christ and you see a stone Ganesh, the elephant god. So you would assume where each one came from. But the elephant god actually came from Indonesia and the wooden Christ was made in Goa, which is a part of India. 
So this is what we're talking about, cross-culture, and how we all, in many ways, not being a gray soup, but have a lot of connections with each other. Uh, India's a peninsula. There was a lot of uh, exchange through the oceans. Uh, Roman um, jewelry has been found in India. Indian textiles have been found in Egypt. And of course, then we went through the Mughal period, the Islamic period, and ended up with a quest for freedom which is the last 200 years where we use the idea of a jail, a jali, a grill. And uh, then went through this very famous Amrita Shergill painting, which you see, she was a famous part Indian, part European artist. And the contradiction between the white and the brown, the white man and the brown uh, man or woman or whatever. And how does that reflect in her work? And how does that reflect today? Who are we all? actually. And it ended with Time Bound. It was a very famous uh, artist called Talur. This is a, a typical Natraj or Shiva, the dancing god. It usually has the dancing god in the center. But this artist says that today, what has become for us to worship is money, money and concrete. And that's what he filled uh, the dancing god with. And uh, this is Rahu, we ended it with this. He eats time. He's the actual eater of time. So how do we manage so many things in our lives? And how does time work within our experiences? The team who worked, I'm going to show you. This is the Nandi bull, which is uh, the vehicle or the Vahana of Shiva also. And it's, uh, it's a very uh, venerable, um, the institution, so to say, and it was brought in at the beginning of the exhibition and it ends with uh, what I explained to you of the dancing shiva. So you can see India still brings in things in very, very different ways. This is one short audio at the end of this section. So each one of the Indian ancient gods, whether it was Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, the creation, existence, destruction, all had vehicles to move. And this was uh, always kept at the entr entrance of a temple. So for this exhibition, it was kept right at the entrance of the exhibition with the discobulus behind it. So that's uh, the final picture of the first section. Then we go on to conservation. Uh, we've conserved over the years, the, I showed this yesterday at a lecture of Professor Jenny's, the Rajavai clock tower, this, uh, and various other. But today I'm showing you, uh, we won the competition for the restoration of the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. Uh, Louis Kahn's work, of course. Um, it's a sad story today, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we have done. So the competition that we won uh, included the 18 dormitories and uh, the Louis Kahn Plaza, the library building, the faculty building, and um, the classroom block. So those were the buildings that, that were what, what was part of our competition. Uh, over the years, you know, they were built in the 60s. Um, there was interventions, maintenance was difficult, the quality of construction itself was uh, needed much to be uh, desired. So there was a lot of deterioration. These are some images of the uh, buildings as they were. Uh, there were no drawings. We actually had to get measured drawings done. I went to the University of Philadelphia, to the Louis Kahn archives for my research. 
uh, and we found some wonderful old pictures that were done, uh, were taken many, many years ago. And this I found when I started um, the restoration process. It was a wall planner, which was up in the office room of, and if you see uh, on the 17th of March, they've said Professor Khan died. And that's all they have written. So he actually passed away after a visit to India. Uh, this was the experimental arch which he built because he was studying about the arch. He wasn't very happy with the type of construction. And we did condition mapping. You know, the buildings were in a very difficult state. We had to do NDT tests. This is actually a lecture in, in, in itself. But I'm just showing you the pointing existed. This is how the pointing was done at that time. It was not recessed. It was done in this manner. And there was very lot of deterioration in the structure, the concrete that was used, exposed bar and steel. So we prepared the conservation plans uh, and then began the work. So this is the plaza which I talked about. So we had to restore the fabric. We had to upgrade the interiors of the library. I'm just going to talk about the library building today. And how do we make it more relevant for uh, what is used by young people today, but without diminishing the value. So a lot of drawings were prepared for um, for this project. These were drawings my studio prepared. And then of course, you know, there are a lot of earthquakes in that area and uh, the buildings had suffered from the 2000 earthquakes, but luckily the library building plan was designed in such a way that it had a lot of stability within its form itself. So there's some images of pre and post restoration. Uh, you can see the photographs. Uh, we had to actually chamfer each brick for the flat arches. We had to re rebuild all, reconstructed all the flat arches. And then we had to create, uh, the terraces were leaking. Some of the slabs had broken and given way. Uh, we had to do what we call the mosaic. China mosaic, we actually break up little, little tiles and then use it for the waterproofing. And then how do we make the library relevant today in terms of light, in terms of the way the students use it without destroying the magnificent triple height and the relationship that uh, Khan had done in his designs of the volumes and the spaces and the connections of this building with all the other buildings. So this is post restoration. Just some images I'm showing you. Um, it won the UNESCO Award of Distinction. And these are the students now who are working in that new signage was brought in. So um, what was the process? This was a picture of the library before we took it over. And these were the condition of the slabs. So here we are talking to people and actually trying to educate uh, and understand teach the, the workmen who were working how restoration of something like this would take place because it certainly wasn't a standard restoration process. And in the middle of all this, uh, the, the institute wanted to have their convocation, so we had to temporarily stop uh, the work and, and then continue it after that. So these were the spaces, the lighting. We also took off all the artwork that existed. Uh, it's very precious. It's a type of um, uh, applique work and it's been uh, sent to Delhi now. We hope it will be repaired and put back where it originally was. But what's happened, uh, unfortunately, is that uh, after this uh, happened and it won uh, the award, a decision was taken by the Institute about the demolition of the uh, dormitory buildings. Um, we had restored one. We chose the worst one to restore. And I personally feel that they could have been restored. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen. Uh, it's still in limbo. But I took the decision that I would withdraw from the project. I mean, I certainly did not want to be party to the demolition of uh, any part of this basic important core of Khan's work. At this point in time, we had begun some work on the faculty building, but it is status quo. We are waiting to see uh, what exactly is going to happen. This is a small clip of what I said soon after the library building was opened. But I don't want you to miss the most important factor of what the IIMA has done today and what a legacy they're going to leave behind and what is the message that they're sending. We know what happened recently 
to Hall of Nations and some other big things which were brought down, unfortunately. So we have to learn and understand that the conservation of our heritage includes 20th century work as well. So this is what happened to the Hall of Nations and this is what's happening to many buildings in our country. Uh, these icons are in distress and the question really is now in a country which is ancient as ours where we have 10,000 listed monuments of the Archaeological Society of India, how do we convince them that 20th century architecture also has value? So it's a fight, it's a battle. Um, I don't know if we'll win or lose, but you can see what is happening uh, in certain parts of India. The third is contemporary architecture. What I want to tell students is that a practice can be diverse, it can be inclusive, it can span community, culture, conservation, but you can also do contemporary work. And each one of these can be done well. It's not that you just, that if you do more than one discipline, that you're less worthy than somebody who concentrates only in that one discipline. I tell young people in India where we have so much to, to uh, look after, where we have to think of a circular economy, where we have to save embodied energy, that each one of us architects when we build new, we have to conserve, we have to look after a country which has 400 million poor people, and how do we do all that together? But we can build new, that's a different type of creativity and a different type of experience. So we do a lot of uh, in, uh, institutional buildings, management buildings, we've done contemporary churches. Uh, some of our work is, of course, in the book and the library as well. So this project was in a hundred acre piece of land and we had to build a million square feet. And uh, it was very flat. There were really no geographical uh, points of interest like mountains, but there was a river which was quite close by called the Narmada River. It was the only river in India which flew, uh, which flows from east to west and not west to east. It was the, it was a campus for Tata Consultancy Services, which is one of the biggest IT companies in the world actually. So tread the land lightly, always listen to the land, put your ear to the land and hear it whisper. That's all very important. And we use the idea, uh, the metaphor of a river, the Narmada River, which is very close. So we understood the client and uh, we believed that this river, our civilizations in India grew up on rivers, beds because of agriculture and the cities like you know, all ancient uh, civilizations grew up along, most of them, along a river bed or along the river. So we divided the campus into three courses, the upper, middle, and the lower course. And we made sure that the central plaza, which flowed from the upper, middle, and lower course, that no cars could enter there. The cars were parked outside and it was purely pedestrian. So the upper course was a tank, a kund, or water body. And then the middle course was the the rocks, which were very jagged. And finally, it goes into the Arabian Sea or the Gulf of Kambat. So we, that was the concept because we had to think of how do we make a campus of a million square feet, not glass boxes, which is happening in so many parts of India. So we began work. This, this to the left is the, is the site plan. And you can see that the whole center is actually a plaza. It was complex. Uh, we had to blow up uh, architecturally each portion. You can see the plans. The landscaping was important, but, but it was, it was lots of fun. And we, the landscape that we used, the greenery that we used was very, uh, relative to that area. We didn't bring in any, uh, Occidental or Western type trees, which had come into India, which need a lot of water, which don't grow so well. So it was quite a wild sort of plantation that existed and uh, where the students can walk and go through. And it's, it's uh, the artwork and the interiors also reflected the river and the colors of the river. We used a lot of local crafts people. These are some drawings we did first um, of the project. And this is after completion. This is the entrance. Uh, this, these are the water bodies that we've created, recycling. It is a very sustainable campus in every way. Um, 
and uh, the landscape, as I explained to you, is not green grass. The idea of lawn is very, very foreign to India. We never had that idea of lawns because they take a lot of water. It was very much brought in uh, by the British. So a lot of areas were going back to removing the idea of green lawns. We can't afford it. We don't have the water for it. We don't have the soil for it. And I do believe that water is going to be a, a very, very major issue um, in the next, I don't know, maybe 50 years or so. So, um, and these are the interiors. They're straightforward and simple. And you'll be happy to see. Today, Mary took me to your ornithology uh, beautiful park, which I thoroughly enjoyed seeing. But I'm happy to tell you that first we just did a sculpture of birds. But now the lower two pictures are the birds that are actually coming back to the campus because of the water and uh, the greenery. And the next is, a uh, this is a small clip of a young girl who works in the campus uh, and what she has to say. Vibrant campus of TCS, situated in the most livable city of India, that is Indore. So let's have a look at the TCS Indore campus. Crawling across 100 acres of land, the world-class facility is inspired by the flow of Narmada and it is divided into three parts. The upper block represents the origin of Narmada, that is the Amar Kalinchak Hills. And as the Narmada flows across the Rift Valleys, we have a similar structure of slanted middle blocks which depict the Beira Ghat, the marble mountain. And the lower block represents the calm of Narmada when it reaches to the Gulf of Khambat. The facility has a fully functional, state-of-the-art, multi-purpose hall, information resource center, gymnasium, two cafeterias, and an amphitheater. So, um, these are images of during the construction. You can see the, the scale, the people working. And I'm showing you this slide because it leads on to something. This is the workers' quarters. And um, we were finally able to ensure that the workers, men and women, had a proper place to stay. This was a battle that I have been fighting for many years. And um, uh, construction labor is the, one of the largest informal uh, groups and highly um, neglected labor in India. They don't have any proper protection and they're really uh, not looked after well. So I'm showing you this picture to show the women over here that finally, after 40 years of working, I was able to ensure that they had the helmets, they had jackets, they had shoes, they're carrying their lunch, and they're going to work. And the women, the shared desire for dignity for women in construction, women in design, and women in crafts, is, is really something that we have to fight very hard for in our country. Um, in 1985, I won a competition with some others for a hotel in the erstwhile Soviet Union. I was in my 30s and there were very few uh, Indian women working in India. And whatever Ukraine and Russia might be doing today, when I went there, um, for the first time I found that there were women structural engineers, women in MEP, mechanical, electrical, in all the different disciplines. And it was an eye-opener for me that, that I saw so many Russian women who were in our field of construction. So it did in, in some way. This is the hotel. It's still standing. And in 2000, when I was building a factory, um, I, I had to fight even to get a playground for the children of the workers. Uh, because there's no organized worker. It's truly exploitation in many ways. Uh, so we began to introduce into our bills of quantities and our specifications and our tender documents that the contractors who make a lot of money, this is the minimum that they have to do. Uh, women always get the worst work to do. They carry the cement concrete on their heads. They carry the bricks on their heads. Uh, this was another project where I talked to these women, we managed to get them helmets at least, it was 2000, and there was a group of seven women, and I asked them what they did with their children, because they didn't have anyone to help, so they said, they formed a group of seven, six of them came to work, and when they, the one who stayed behind looked after their children, and when they went back in the evening, they would share their daily wages with all seven. 
So it's always a struggle, and I think it's a responsibility of each one of us to m- ensure that construction labor, whether it's men, women, or children, have to be looked after. And I'm very sorry to say that there's a lot of exploitation of construction labor in Gulf countries also, and we have architects from the Western world who have actually said that it really is not their responsibility, but it is. It is their responsibility. Uh, we started a small school. The contractor said he cannot have a school there. It's too expensive. So we said at least have a classroom. Uh, keep the children. They might be of different ages, but at least they will be protected and safe during the day. So what we've tried to do is we don't want them to be doing what the left picture says. There is a, a self-employed women's organization in Ahmedabad, uh, which is teaching women to become masons and carpenters. And I was so impressed once coming to an American site and seeing women uh, who were who were working, who were welding. You never see that in India. They're never carpenters. They're never masons. They're always carrying loads on their head. And um, now I have worked, many people have worked, it's not me, uh, to teach them to become painters and get some other work in the construction industry because the construction industry is the single biggest industry in our country. I also started the Hekar Foundation. We had two com- uh, two conferences. One is Women in Architecture in 2000, and one was Women in Design. Um, there's a short clip of mine of Women in Architecture, which is self-explanatory. 20 years ago, over 200 architects from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Singapore and Australia got together to celebrate. We all have had common traditions, problems and aspirations. We all come from countries that have a multiplicity of civilizations and enjoy a cultural heritage of genius and beauty. These traditions are a source of inspiration to us architects as we attempt to infuse meaning into our work. 25 women exhibited their work at the National Gallery of Modern Art to express the collective power of women in architecture. We celebrated the work of South Asia's first three women architects, Yasmin Lari from Pakistan. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I bring you greetings from women of Pakistan. Minute De Silva from Sri Lanka. Minute would have loved to be here. She is the type of person who would have thoroughly enjoyed this type of meeting. And Perrin Mistri, the first woman to qualify as an architect in India. 20 years later, we welcome back and many more old and new friends who join us this year to a conference that spans three days with 35 speakers and over 600 delegates and an exhibition of the past, present and future of design seen through the eyes of a diverse set of design professionals captured forever in a digital archive. Welcome to Women in Design 2020 Plus. And this was uh, in 2020, and we've got Majin here. Uh, she came as with many other of my good friends, Billy, uh, whom we have worked on a project together, Annabella and Kathleen. So what I want to say here before I go on to the last uh, section, that towers are rising, highways are unfurling, tunnels are being bored, bridges are being erected, yet quietly, even insidiously, they seem devoid of women. On two of my recent sites, there wasn't a single woman. The construction industry is the single largest unorganized sector in India. If they don't have women working there, what do you think is going to happen? In India, female participation in the labor force across the board has fallen from 35% in 1990 to 27% in 2018. The pandemic probably made things even worse. The statistics for those working in architecture must be even more alarming. Being a woman on a construction site in any capacity is challenging. Architecture and construction is technically and physically challenging. It's a challenging profession and a challenging industry. As more women are found working successfully in these spaces, we are still in the minority. Whether it is ensuring the safety and working conditions for women labor, to women supervisors being able to manage male labor, female site supervisors, architects or design consultants that have to lead projects. The challenges in these spaces are many. This is where mentorship is critical and women can be inspired by the stories of challenges being innovatively and bravely taken on by women professionals. Women must raise the spirit of each other and it is important for men to understand this 
and be an integral part of this movement forward. So we also had an exhibition of textiles done by rural women. You can see the sophistication of the design that these two women did from a very small village in India. This is what they said. I also worked with Todd and Billy, uh, who are doing the Obama Library for many years, where we uh, actually wove very large fabrics created looms. And we also have done um, different types of artwork in many uh, corporate buildings. Recently, during the pandemic, we had to redo uh, an entire building in Mumbai. And the client gave us money. Uh, I think, you know, in countries like Germany, almost, I don't know the exact percentage, but a certain percentage of a project has to be given to artwork. We fight for that. And what we did during the pandemic, we hired 200 not so well-known artists and we got them to use repurposed wood, e-waste, magazines to do the entire artwork for this full building. Uh, recently, it won actually an honorable mention from the Chicago Athenaeum. So many, many ways one can work and help the crafts, uh, uh, which is dominated actually by women all over the world. So where women are concerned, before I go into the last section, and what of all those nameless hands that chiseled and carved, hauled and lifted, placed and set each block of someone else's dream and made it real? then walked away into the invisible footnotes of history. So my last uh, section is a community project. Uh, we do a, a, a fair amount of pro bono work. Um, I think it's important in a relatively mixed, rich and poor country like India is today that this can be done, whether it's converting garbage dumps into uh, parks, whether it's looking after the girl child, orphans, so um, I visited uh, the Roosevelt um, Museum a couple of years ago, and I, I just love the saying that the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And I thought, you know, he he's really said something very, very important. So this was a village which was completely devastated. Some of you may have uh, seen this before uh, by the earthquake. Uh, this is a photograph of the school. And um, it was Republic Day. It was cold. Uh, it was a very severe earthquake. It was the same earthquake that uh, hit some of the buildings, Khan's buildings in Ahmedabad. 90% of this village was devastated. And this is what the government was doing. It was finding pieces of land that were empty and tuck, 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 tuck on a grid, building houses, identical houses. They didn't really care who was next to whom, what they had. So when I went to this village, a client of mine decided to fund it for whom I did other corporate work. So it was you know, we had a good understanding. I would do his corporate work and I would do his free work as well. So we actually mapped out the village. Uh, we found out who lived next to who. And the woman to the right with the pink shirt, she was the tough uh, boss of the entire village. And but for her, I don't think we, we could have done what we did. So um, the essence of dignity is who are we in the world and what is it that we each one of us deserves. So we went around the village, we spoke to people, we spent a lot of time there. And to cut a long story short, what we really did was um, we provided the materials because they, they were very depressed, the villagers. I mean, they had destroyed every everything was destroyed. We provided the materials for them free of cost. And we told them they had to rebuild the village themselves. And we would pay them labor. It took a long while, but finally they got into it. They rebuilt the village. We saved all the doors and windows. We reused that to give a sense of identity and also the embodied energy of the wood. We used all the rubble of the earthquake for the foundations. And here are some images. Uh, they're a very artistic village. They did a lot of batik. They painted their homes. It was an unusual village because the villages that were predominantly Hindu were taken over by Hindu NGOs and looked after. The ones that were predominantly Muslim were taken over by Muslim NGOs. 
So we looked for a village that nobody wanted because it was a 50-50 and it gave us the greatest satisfaction because the Dargah was rebuilt, the temples were rebuilt. Um, as you know, whenever there's an earthquake, the water goes uh, saline. So we had to create uh, new water, sh- water bodies to make sure. Uh, this, these are the two structural engineers who were on site. And the school was devastated. And they came to me and they said, if you don't do something fast, the children will be taken away to the fields and we will never get them back in school. So the picture to the left shows just a temporary open air school that we got for them because this picture to the right was what had happened to their school. And uh, a farmer near the school gave us more land. So I told my client that I want to build a center for women, a center, a creche, as well as the school. And he funded it and um, it, it got chosen by the fine uh, as one of the best buildings. Actually, it's a tiny building of the 21st century. So the people who built it were very happy. It's a very simple school, um, very simple materials. Uh, these are the children who who enjoy it now. And this is Mezabin. Mezabin was a little girl in 2002 when I first went. And she and her parents slept out in the open because they said they did not want to go into the crisscross grid that the government was doing. I said, you're willing to spend your time in the cold open? They said, yes, as long as we are put back into our same house uh, in the same piece of land. And we continue to visit the village. This is Mayor's been in 2006. And now in 2016, now she's grown up. She's gone to a college nearby. So there's a short little film. Um, on the village.
this is Mayor Zubin today. She was looking at a little document that we had uh, prepared about the story of the village. It's won awards for the maximum number of trees. Today there are, uh, they're exporting the Bandini work, which is their tie and dye work around the world because they're, everyone in, you know, they're one, then one billion cell phones in India today. So looking back, one wonders whether all this would have happened but for the earthquake. So in times of trial and tribulation, maybe the best comes out in us. So I'm ending with a small story. It's a tribal story. Um, it's a story of a bird. Um, because young people often ask me, you know, what is it we can do to make a difference? Um, there was a huge fire in a, in a forest. It was a very, very big fire. And all the animals ran away. And uh, only this little bird stayed. And it, it used to fly to a little small body of water. And in its beak, it would pick up a little water and come and try to put out the fire. So all the animals laughed at it and said, you know, you think this is going to help? So the little bird said, at least I'm doing my bit. And I told, um, when I was giving a talk once, I said the story and I said everybody should go and do their bit and not worry about the implications or the effect of that. The next day in my email box, I had a huge number of emails from young people who told me that I didn't tell them the rest of the story. So apparently the rest of the story was that the gods above were watching this little bird doing its bit. And the gods felt so sad that they began to cry. And when gods cry, it comes down as rain. And the rain put off the fire. So each one of us must go out and do our bit. Thank you.